to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea and this is episode 129. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra snippets of history, travel and storytelling that we always hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. Now I have a very special guest joining me today, my good friend Sophia Capella. Some of you may already know Sophia as a knitwear designer or through her YouTube channel, Sophia's Tales. And Madeline, who's my daughter and the co-host of Fruity Knitting, has temporarily given up her seat on the Fruity Knitting couch so Sophia can join us as our special guest for this episode. It is so good to have you here with us. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. It's lovely to be here, here on the couch with you in the Fruity Knitting podcast, as well as uh, here in Offenbach visiting you and Madeline and uh, having a good time. It's always such a treat to spend time with you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here today to um, share some of my design with you and also talk a bit about my recent pilgrimage. I have walked a medieval pilgrimage trail that runs all the way uh, through Sweden to the Norwegian uh, town Trondheim. And this pilgrimage has influenced my life as well as my design in a profound way. And Sophia is going to show us a collection of designs that she's based on this pilgrimage today, which we're looking forward to. So let me tell you what else is in the episode. We are featuring two very different guest artists. So one is from the hand knitting fashion and design world, and that's the British knitwear designer Erica Knight. And the other is from the world of music and composing and improvising. And that's the Australian concert pianist Ashley Hariba. Coincidentally, despite coming from two very different disciplines, they both tell us the same message during their interviews. So here's some of the things you're going to hear them say. Embrace your mistakes because sometimes they can start a new flicker of inspiration. Every fault's a fashion. And honour your mistakes as hidden intentions. So apart from the word fashion, it's hard to guess who might have said what, either the knitwear designer or the musician. And I find that really interesting because... Yes, so do I. Yeah. I can really relate to those quotes. Yeah, definitely. Because also even in science, some things have been discovered or invented through accidents. And like Sophia said, those quotes also really apply to us on our journey to becoming better knitters. So our feature interview, which is always at the end of the program, is with Erica Knight. And Erica has published numerous books on knitting, crocheting and crafting, and she's developed many yarn ranges. She's also really passionate about British wool and supporting sustainable businesses. It was such an honor to meet and interview Erica. She is incredibly charming, so I think you're really going to enjoy meeting her too. And then in our maker segment, we're featuring the brilliant pianist, Ashley Hariba, who I first met when I was 21. Okay, like last week. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia's charming as well. So Ashley and I studied piano performance together at the Adelaide Conservatorium in Australia. And Ashley was back then and still is today an outstanding talent, both as a pianist and as an improviser composer. He's now living in Germany. And last summer we reconnected after a gap of about 30 years, which was quite incredible. And I asked him to come on to Fruity Knitting and share his talent with you. Now, I know it is a knitting show, but whether or not you are a fan of classical music, I think you're going to love this segment. Ashley plays the Fruity Knitting opening theme otherwise known as the Bach Prelude in C-sharp major. And he shows us how Bach and other composers left little portholes in their written compositions for the musician to, or the performer to, just take off and do their own thing or to improvise like a jazz musician does. So music was my first great love and I'm particularly excited about bringing you this segment. So that's the summary of today's program. And now I'm really excited. We're going to get straight into Bring and Brag with your design, Heart of the Forest. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this is my design, Heart of the Forest. I first uh, released the pattern for the sock. This is two different colorways. And uh, then came the mitten. And after that also a hat. And this design, Heart of the Forest, was inspired by my pilgrimage on St. Olavsleden. St. Olafsleden is uh, the Scandinavian equivalent to El Camino de Santiago de Compostela. 
the famous pilgrim route to Spain. And St. Olaf's Leden is approximately 580 kilometers long. It runs from the Swedish east coast all the way through Sweden to the Norwegian west coast. To, and the goal is uh, the medieval Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim. Uh, so uh, this uh, pilgrimage trail, it runs through large forests, over mountains and uh, along rivers and lakes past historic sites and waterfalls and through small towns and communities. And I walked this pilgrimage trail uh, in three stages during the past three years. So I started in 2020 and last summer I reached Trondheim and the Nidaros Cathedral. What an amazing thing to do during the pandemic. Yes, it was in so many ways, yeah. really uh, an, a fantastic, fantastic experience and a, a good time to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and during these three years, my life has changed a lot uh, for the better, I'm glad to say. <laughs> um, but before this adventure, I had been through some really, really tough times. And this pilgrimage helped me uh, to heal. Uh, it was a very important uh, journey for you. It was an important journey for me, both an inner and an outer journey, as you say, that a pilgrimage is, and it really, really was. So um, I walked most of the trail all on my own, by myself, and that was an amazing experience to do so. And uh, I, I felt I grew as a person, uh, as a woman and a pilgrim. It's so healing to spend time in the woods. Nothing is false here. There are no lies. Everything is what it seems to be, genuine and real. A tree is a tree, a stone is a stone, a fox is a fox, and I can trust my map and my compass. The landscape does not fool me. I trust my breath, my steps, my beating heart, the sun on my face and the wind in my back. I feel embraced and carried by love, by a greater force. Everything becomes clear and obvious. Perspectives change and life's circumstances seem much better when I'm walking in the woods. There is something so comforting in knowing I play a small role within a larger context. I'm letting go of what is not serving me and at the same time taking responsibility for my own steps through the landscape as well as through life. I can only carry what's in my backpack and my pockets. The truth becomes apparent and I want to live my life gracefully in love and honesty. Knitting is such a big part of me and I wanted to um, capture my experience from my pilgrimage on St. Oblasleden in a new design. So I started to knit Heart of the Forest as I was walking on this pilgrimage. And uh, just like knitting, walking can be so healing. Yeah. You find that too? Yeah, totally. Yes. And uh, when I'm knitting and the soft yarn runs through my fingers slowly being worked stitch by stitch into something warm and beautiful. I also think that the rhythm of my knitting as well as the rhythm of my heartbeat uh, somehow is combined with uh, or connected to the rhythm of my footsteps as I walk through the forest. So I, I took all the, uh, all the trees of the forests and uh, placed them on my uh, socks and uh, on my mittens and also on my hat. And among all the trees, I placed my heart where I could guard it and it could be protected uh, because I want my heart to be guarded as everything I do flows from it. So, uh, so here's on, the heart here. Exactly. On the sock, it's placed under the foot so that you, in each step you take, you'll be, you'll be reminded of your heart that is pumping through your body and, and make you uh, come alive and, yeah. and, 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 and make that's, you, that's make you warm. That's a gorgeous little hidden spot to mm -hmm. put it. 
And, and on the mitten, the heart is uh, inside the hand. So it's also there. hidden. Exactly. And on the hat, you can place the heart wherever you want. You just leave out um, a tree of your choice as you knit the hat. And then uh, as you have finished yeah. the hat, you can uh, embroider it with duplicate stitch. Okay. Yes. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So um, the sock is, um, is knitted top down and it has a, a traditional heel flap. But then the gusset is not placed on the sides as, as uh, it's, normal, it's yeah. normally done. So it's placed under the foot, uh, which also makes it, pos it possible to, to place the heart ah, uh, under the heel okay. like this. That's so cute. Yeah. And it's a really good little pattern, isn't it? It's, um, <laughs> Thank you. Because the floats wouldn't be very long either, so no. it's suitable for... And it's fairly repetitive also. Yeah. And... and uh, on the mitten, as, as I showed before, the heart is on the inside of the hand and the mitten has this ribbed, folded um, cuff, cuff as a, so it gives a snug and cozy fit. And it also has a thumb gusset for a, for a good fit. Uh, yeah, you can try it on. <laughs> does it fit well? <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. And you can choose if you want to have it like Down this or, or, or fold, fold it. it. Yeah. yeah. And it has a rounded top, both on the mitten and on the thumb, which I find kind of, um, yeah, it looks good and cozy, a bit old fashioned somehow. And, yeah. and, uh, and I also find it very comfortable. So how is that? What's it? Because this is the traditional um Yes, this is another top pattern of, the, of mine. Yeah. Look, um, it's Lukta. And it has this pointy top, which is uh, very common on, on traditional Scandinavian yeah. patterns. And this one, is that done more like a hat? Exactly. It's okay. like actually, the crown of a hat. It's done uh, a, a lot like a hat. So it's, it's, it's rounded. So you yeah. um, make the decreases more evenly spread around, the, around it. Around the top. Yeah. And this has got a gorgeous... Uh, yeah, crown on it yeah. because the the hat also has this folded uh, ribbing and then when you do the decreases uh, to form the crown uh, you also uh, knit this uh, star which I like to think of as the star who's watching over and leading the leading the way and also watching over the forest and uh, protecting the uh, the heart did you do there. any walking in the evening um, when it was dusk on the pilgrimage or? no because it was I, I've done the walking in the summer or when it's okay. uh, always light very and light <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yes okay. it's very beautiful there's yeah. lots of lovely symbols in it thank you so these heart of the forest patterns are very important to me like all my patterns are but these are kind of special and very close to my heart uh, they are in fact a creative manifestation in wool uh, on how this pilgrimage has enriched my life and I love knitting them, I love wearing them, and I also enjoy seeing other people knit them and, and wear them. So I hope that I uh, somehow can pass on um, a piece of my adventure to you as you knit my patterns. Oh, that's very romantic. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that. And you've actually also bought some other patterns too, haven't you? Yes, I did. Oh, I forgot to mention, oh, uh, yeah. on the sock, <laughs> you this can, if you want to, yeah. you can knit in beads into your trees, like uh, little Christmas decorations or just to make a fancy sock. That is a very gorgeous <laughs> Christmas sock. Yeah, it's, it was heart. such a playful thing to do. I really enjoyed doing that. And, of course, the instructions on how to knit in the beads are included in the pattern. It's beautiful. It's really Thank beautiful. You. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the next patterns. Yes, I brought my Shine socks that I released last year, um, many years ago, or many, many, but like I think in maybe 2016, I released my first mitten pattern, which was the Shine mittens. And Madeline has knitted yes. that pattern. <laughs> she loves these. <laughs> yeah, she wears so them a lot. Yeah. yeah. And the shine mittens quickly became a very popular pattern. And I, I decided back then that I wanted to make also a sock, but I haven't had time. Life has come in between. But now it was time to release the shine socks. So uh, these are the shine socks. And this pattern is, um, if you're a, a bit comfortable by holding two strands of yarn, it isn't so difficult. It looks more advanced than, than it actually is because it's uh, very short floats on the, uh, on the back of your work. Yes. And, 
and also very repetitive pattern. So it's easy to memorize when you have um, knitted a couple of rounds. And you've got a little star. Exactly. It's the same kind of gusset and, and, and heel as on uh, Heart of the Forest. But here, instead of a heart, there's a, a star. Because the name of this sock is Shine Socks. And I, I choose that name because I wanted us to be reminded uh, to shine and let shine. That, you know, uh, light shines in the darkness and darkness has not overcome it. And uh, we... Um, I think it's important to uh, spread light and, and try to uh, make a difference in that way and, and be kind and, and, and spread light. And there's always light, even at dark times. And I know <laughs> times can be really dark, but you know, the sun is always shining behind the clouds. And you're always giving light and love to other people. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and I, one, I do my best. <laughs> there's one more design that's also got symbols in it. Yes, um, exactly. I like symbols. <laughs> that uh, carry some form of meaning. So this is my faith, hope and love mittens that I released uh, before uh, Christmas. So it's my most recent pattern. And on the inside, you can see the symbol of the faith, hope and love, which I find a very important and meaningful um, symbol, a very old one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in my faith and my love, I can find hope that makes me uh, uh, go through uh, dark as well as light times in life. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this mitten also has this rounded top, as uh, you could see on the Heart of the Forest mitten. And it has a Latvian braid uh, in between the, the cuff of the mitten and the, and the mitten. And both the top of the mitten and the thumb uh, is rounded. And I, I, yeah, I like to have symbols that I find meaningful, yeah. kind of a bit hidden, but easy to detect. And, and, and this way, uh, you know, I, I carry these symbols in my stitches and I carry them with me when I wear, as I wear my mittens. You really do intertwine your life experience into your patterns, don't you? I do. Thank you for <laughs> seeing that. Because, yes, to me, it's more than knitting and more than designing. It's kind of, yeah, <laughs> I always have a story behind uh, behind my patterns. Yeah. So. And Sophia is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount of all her beautiful designs from her Ravelry store. And Sophia has many more charming mitten, hat, sock, and shawl designs that you can choose from, so enjoy browsing through her store. So we're staying in Bring and Brag with me because I've got a new project to show you. I've been working on this lace shawl design by the designer Romy Hill. This is going to be a birthday present for a special lady who's turning 83 and she's got white hair and blue eyes and I thought this colour would just look lovely on her. I think she's going to love it. I hope so. It's very gorgeous. So it's called Dark Wing and the design was inspired by the character Maleficent from the story of Sleeping Beauty. So here's a picture of the original design and Romy Hill, who is the designer, writes that as a child she was transfixed by fairy tales and as an adult the movie Maleficent touched her in a way that no other fairy story previously did and that's because it celebrates loyalty, strength, the power of true love and the ability to change your own fate. So Romy designed the shawl with its midnight colour and delicate feather-like lace as a homage to all that is at once dark and light, to change, depth and heart, and to flight, both literal and figurative. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I thought that was a really charming and poetic description of the inspiration behind the design, so I wanted to share that with you. But as you can see, the colour of my shawl isn't quite so dark, but when I was choosing the yarn, I just thought that this colour was both a beautiful and a safe choice to give as a gift. Absolutely. So my yarn is hand dyed by a yarn dyer who's local to me here in Frankfurt, Germany called Scudderia. And the owner of Scudderia has a little flock of Scudder sheep, which is the native German breed of sheep. And that's a connection to her business name, Scudderia. But the fleece of the Scudder sheep is pretty coarse, so her yarn isn't coming from her flock of sheep. So this yarn is a 50-50 blend of silk and merino and the design is well the shawl is designed to only use one skein of yarn and I actually had a fair bit left over so it's a 
top-down crescent-shaped shawl that's worked with short row shaping. So I'm going to show you a diagram to show you how it's constructed. Top-down short row crescent shawls are knitted by casting on the number of stitches for the top of the shawl. Then the short rows are knitted from the neck down by knitting to a few edge stitches and then turning your work and knitting back, leaving the same number of stitches unworked on the opposite side. So each subsequent short row is reduced by that number of stitches. So for example, if you're going to work to three stitches from the edge on the first row and the corresponding wrong side row, you'll knit to three stitches before the turn on each subsequent row. So that's how this central garter stitch crescent shape has been formed. So you're casting on stitches initially right across the top from here to there. Then you're working your short row shaping down to the depth that you want. And then on the final row, you knit through all of your wraps and turns, picking up the wraps and turns. In my case, I use German short rows. And then you've got clean knit stitches on your needles and you're ready to work the lace section, which is just back and forward in normal rows. So it's been a long time since I've done any lace knitting. It was really fun to get back into it. Have you done lace knitting? I have, for, uh, but it was a long time ago now. Yeah, I yes. think the last time I did lace knitting might have been this lace. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I knitted this quite a few years ago. So it was fun to get back into it, but fixing mistakes in lace knitting is much harder than with other techniques. So it is actually better to learn how to avoid making mistakes than to fix them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to share some of the things that I do to try to keep track of the pattern and hopefully avoid making mistakes. So the first thing I use is a lifeline. Do you use? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's a good thing. So a lifeline is typically a piece of waste yarn that's threaded through all of your stitches on one row of your pattern. So if you make a mistake, you pull out your needles and quickly rip back to that row, knowing that all the stitches are held really safely there for you. And if you're doing a difficult lace pattern, it's a really good idea to put it in every couple of rows so that you're never losing much of your work if you have to rip back. So what I typically do is... Get a piece of dental floss, which I've shown you before. That's really smart because it doesn't get stuck as, as yarn might yeah. do. Yeah. You can also use some um, cotton thread. Yeah. And I thread it through the hole, you can see it here, of my interchangeable needles. And then I just knit across the row and that carries the lifeline mm -hmm. across. That's so much quicker than having to get a tapestry needle and, and yeah, thread through. So it ha that happens really fast. That's smart. Yes. <laughs> And the other great thing to use is stitch markers. And on this project, I used the Coco Knits Small Coloured Stitch Markers. Adding a stitch marker around each repeat helps you quickly spot a problem in your lace pattern because you immediately see that there are either too few or too many stitches remaining in each pattern repeat. And that means that you can recognise a mistake before you even finish the row and then you only need to unpick a few stitches. Also, if you have stitch markers around each repeat, it helps you recognize the pattern's features, which will usually be symmetrical and that helps you memorize the pattern quicker. So placing stitch markers around each pattern repeat really works well on fairly simple lace because the paired increases and decreases will always stay within that pattern repeat. Oh, yes. <laughs> But with difficult lace patterns, the paired increases and decreases can shift every few rows. So for example, one row can significantly increase the total stitch count. And then on the following row, the total stitch count can be significantly decreased. And then the stitch markers will get lost in uh, between. They, they get you confused. Yeah, yeah, they can get lost in between a knit two together or a yarn over. And that is so frustrating. Yeah. So unfortunately, with difficult lace patterns, when you really do need as much help as you can get, sometimes you can't even use stitch markers. Oh, and there's one more tip I want to tell you about, and that is the most common mistake to make in lace knitting is to forget to work a yarn over. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I know about that. But it's also the easiest to fix. It is. You can just pick up the... Yeah, yeah. You can take the horizontal bar that goes between two stitches, make that into a yarn over and then ladder it up to your current row. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a good little trick to know. So I hope those hints help you if you're, if you're knitting some lace right now. So this was a quick knit. This was an intermediate pattern. So the paired increases and decrease did shift, but only a couple of times. I'm so glad that I knitted it up so fast uh, and it's ready to be given away. 
but I've only just finished it so I haven't had a chance to uh, film Madeline modeling it which I like to do because it's always much better to see what it looks like on the body so I'm going to film her and show you in the next episode but this is sort of what it can look like it's so beautiful so beautiful it's very elegant lace yes, isn't it and it's like your color too thank you <laughs> and I've got dragon sickness but I think I'm getting over it because I'm quite happy to give it away <laughs> yeah, it's good yeah it is it's a lace uh, shawls like this are really great to wear with evening clothes too yes, aren't yes. they it's yeah. elegant okay so coming up now is our maker segment with the pianist Ashley Hariba it really isn't typical for a classically trained pianist to start improvising in the middle of a Beethoven or Mozart piano sonata, particularly in a very proper classical concert setting. But Ashley does do this. He's a bit of a rebel. And apart from being brilliant, Ashley is funny and charming and very casual in a typical Australian way. So I hope you enjoy the segment and we'll see you on the other side. Hi, my name's Ashley and I make music. So I had a fairly rigid classical piano training. I studied at the School for Music and Theatre in Hanover in Germany. Back home in Australia, I did my masters at Melbourne University. And a few years ago, I finished my PhD at the University of Adelaide. My teachers were quite influential, but some of them were quite dominating, which is not always a good thing, but not entirely bad either. During my studies, I often questioned the teacher-student role and found myself mediating between obedience and rebellion. And I'm sure this rebellion against authority is instinctual and built into the human condition, but I'm sure it varies from person to person. Later, I realized that the composer-student, or later I realized that the uh, teacher-student relationship kind of reflected the uh, connection between the composer, so the written music, and the performer, the interpreter, because there's a limit in how information can be passed on from the teacher to the student, and similarly there is uh, a limitation in how musical notation, or even words for that matter, can be passed on or communicated. I teach piano myself and spend a lot of time thinking about the connection between the composer and the performer. So improvisation is a lost art amongst classical pianists. For example, it's very rare to see a classically trained pianist improvise within the context of a Beethoven sonata. To my mind, there is a misleading pursuit uh, to honour or be true to the composer, which can lead to more or less the same musical phrasing and the window of interpretation can become quite narrow. I think composers, all the great composers, knew about these limitations and left what I like to call little portholes in their music so that uh, suggesting that the performer could go off and do their own thing, improvise or adding to the conversation. This was a big part of my PhD thesis, and today I'd like to show you a few examples of that. So you just heard me play the Prelude in C-sharp major from the World Temper Clavier, book one by Johann Sebastian Bach. I love Bach because he was such a great architect of music, as Glenn Gould would say. You could play his music fast, slow, loud, soft, on a crappy out-of-tune piano or any instrument, and it still sounds good. What he would sometimes do in his music is um, create a wonderful progression 
and um, it'll build up and then create a scenario where you think it could actually go there or there. It has many different options. So uh, I'll just play the ending of that Bach again, exactly how Bach wrote it. And this is what you could do instead of that. So you never know what's going to happen or wherever you're going to land. But anyway, uh, another composer um, did a similar thing. And what he did it was actually create the illusion of an improvisation. That was what I just played with the Bach. It's kind of a smaller portal. It's less obvious. But here, um, um, this composer did something a little bit different. And I'm sure you know who uh, this composer is. That's the Fur Lies by Ludwig van Beethoven. In the middle of that piece, it goes into a kind of a development section and uh, it's sort of leading somewhere and you're not sure where it's heading. Anyway, this is how Beethoven actually wrote this bit. Etc. Etc. But um, here's a, another possibility. Etc. Etc. As a performer, I think diving into these portals is a healthy thing. I think uh, it's good to disrupt the status quo and to shed light on stale conventions. And I'm sure composers back in the day expected this of the performer. Jazz players do it all the time. They play a melody and then they repeatedly improvise on it and go on off on all sorts of tangents. Which brings me to an interesting classical tradition, which is uh, where composers, they would get a melody and sometimes borrow from another composer and write variations on it. So like variations on a theme by or uh, yeah, that kind of thing, pa variations. So Nikolai Paganini was a great violin virtuoso. He could play anything on the violin. He was a bit of a freak. He looked almost a little bit like the devil, and I'm sure it was a marketing tool. But anyway, he wrote 24 caprices, and the 24th caprice is probably the most famous one, and it goes like this. And that bit repeats, and then it goes. What Brahms would do, which was around the same time, Brahms was a famous uh, German composer and pianist, he would wrote, wrote very difficult variations on this piece. Anyway, very fast, jumping around. Um, for some reason, these variations were used to really show off the dexterity of the performer. Another composer, uh, Sergei Rachmaninoff, Russian composer, did something a little bit more unusual with this um, theme. He wrote a beautiful piece, Rhapsody on a Theme by Paganini. Uh, in the slow part, he inverts it, 
puts it in D flat major and it makes some changes. So instead of this, it goes. And you've probably heard this beautiful slow part of uh, the introduction to this theme. The strings come in, it's a very Hollywood sounding, schmaltzy uh, variation. And Rachmaninoff said, uh, this is a variation for my agent. <laughs> anyway, I wrote my own Paganini variations a few years ago, and uh, they're a little quirky. And I have to admit, I drank a lot of coffee at the time, probably too much. And so there's a lot of notes, and it turned out to be a sort of a, uh, a musical collage. So a lot of different styles in the one piece. So a bit of jazz, bossa nova, uh, walking bass, a bit of avant-garde. I was even inspired by a Jackie Chan uh, film soundtrack. And um, it starts off like this. Then the next variation goes like this, it's a bit, bit groovy. The next variation is a, sounds a little bit like a fly trapped in a coke can somewhere in the Australian outback. goes into a kind of a walking bass line. And then it goes uh, off into a sort of a uh, bossa nova bit. And I also have a um, slow section that I included, and it goes a little like this. Just to finish, I'd, I'd like to wrap it up now with a couple of my favorite quotes. And this is, one, this is one by Rollo May. Creativity arises out of the tension between spontaneity and limitations, the latter like riverbanks forcing the spontaneity into various forms which are essential for a work of art. And another one by Brian Eno, honor your mistakes as hidden intentions.
<laughs> Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed seeing Ashley and I hope you also really enjoyed seeing the fruity knitting opening theme being played live. I know, that was such a cool idea, Mum. Yeah, it was. It was great. So Madeline and I had a great day with Ashley filming that segment for you. And the grand piano is such a marvellous instrument. It was so much fun just to mess around and take interesting angles of Ashley's hands and face in the reflection of the piano. Yes, you did have a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> it's a beautiful instrument to, to film, actually, yeah. You'll see Ashley playing in another outtake right at the end of this episode, so don't forget to watch that. That happens right at the end of the interview with Erica. And if you'd like to support Ashley by buying some of his music, and musicians always need as much support as they can get, you can visit his website, and his music is available to download on Spotify and Apple Music. And I'd like to remind you that to keep producing Fruity Knitting, we do need viewers to become patrons, even though you don't need to to watch the show because the content is all available for free. That's because we don't sell anything. We don't have an online store that's supporting the YouTube channel and we don't receive money from advertising or sponsorship. And any YouTube ads that you might see during the episode, the money is going to the musicians because of the music that we choose to use. So we're not earning any money through YouTube ads either. And just for general information, you have to have a lot more views than what we have to even have a, a basic stable income from YouTube ads. Yeah. So if you are watching, please do support our work by becoming a patron. It is very easy and flexible to do this and you can do so for just the cost of one coffee per month and every single patron makes a difference to us and thank you to the wonderful patrons who have kept the show going so far thank you very much as you can see madeline's joined us she's going to give us an update on her chessboard which i've got right here it's just very big it's massive <laughs> so we have to prop it up behind us Yes, yeah, so last episode I showed you my latest project, which is a chess set. You knit both a board and the 32 playing pieces. And as you can see, my board is now complete, so I'll give you an update on how I put it together. But first, for any new viewers, here's a picture of the original design. It's a pattern by the UK toy designer Alan Dart, who we featured on the show back in episode 118. I think I haven't been more excited about any knitting project as much as I am about this chess set. I love how it looks, and I can't wait to finish it and actually play chess with it. It's actually quite big. The tallest chess piece measures 13.5 centimeters, and the board is supposed to measure 57 square centimeters with a gauge of 20 stitches to 26 rows. Now my gauge was larger at 17 stitches to 23 rows across 10 square centimeters, and this surprised me because usually I'm a really tight knitter. Anyway, it means that my board is 64 square centimetres, which is 7 square centimetres larger than the original design. For the checkered pattern, I knitted 8 columns of black and white squares, and then I sewed the columns together using mattress stitch, which creates an invisible seam. So with mattress stitch, you effectively hide 2 stitches per column on the back of your knitting, and Alan planned for this by adding additional stitches. So each column is originally 16 stitches wide, but when you've sewn them together, they're only 14 stitches wide. Doing the mattress stitch was quite time consuming, so mum generously offered to help me and I was very grateful for that. <laughs> Once we had sewn all the strips together, I had to pick up stitches along all four sides to create the edging. And for the edging I chose this lovely red wine colour here. Now the pattern tells you to knit the four edges separately in stocking stitch with a single purl row for the fold line. Yeah. And later when you attach your knitting to the board, the purl row lines up with the edges of the board. That's actually really helpful. Yes. The mitered corners are worked by increasing one stitch at each end of every row. Then after you've knitted the purl fold line, you decrease one stitch at each end of every row. And when all four edges have been knitted, you mattress stitch the corners together and you end up with a nice little pocket edging for the board to slip into. After completing all the knitting and sewing, you glue the knitted checker pattern onto your mounting board. To do this, we first stuck some double-sided tape close to each of the four edges. Then I placed the knitted checker pattern onto the table with the right side facing down. And I put my mounting board on top with the sticky tape facing upwards. 
Next, I aligned the purl row with the edges of the board. Then I carefully folded the knitting over and held it in place by pressing it down onto the sticky tape. Then I turned the board over again to make sure that the knitting looks even and it isn't skewed into one direction or the other. If it is uneven, you can just lift the knitting off the sticky tape and readjust it. So once I saw that everything was lined up well, I turned my board over again, put a line of glue on the wrong side of the knitting close to the cast off edge, and then I pressed it down to secure it. I used a German glue called Uhu, which is supposed to be strong and stick to almost everything, including metal and wood. It worked well for me and I am very delighted with the result. Yeah, so this is my finished chessboard. It's very solid and quite heavy, but I'm happy with that because I don't want the board to break. I've also knitted some more playing pieces, which I will show you in the next episode. So coming up next is our interview with the British knitwear designer, Erica Knight. Over the years, Erica has acted as a design consultant for many different craft brands. And uh, more recently, she developed the Pebble Island yarn range for Rowan. We've talked about this yarn range before on the show because it has a really interesting origin story. Here are some of the colors and I knitted two different Lake Reed hats in, in these yarns. Yeah, that's mine and I love it. I wear yeah. it all the time. So during the interview, Erica is going to talk about uh, how this is produced, the Pebble Island yarn, and also how she developed the colorway for it. And Rowan is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 40% discount off the Pebble Island yarn and accompanying patterns when purchased together from their online shop. That's a really generous offer to our patrons, so thanks very much to Rowan. And Erica is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount off the patterns in her Erica Knight Ravelry store. And her designs are well known worldwide as having a very modern and stylish aesthetic, as well as being very intuitive to the knitter. And many of them are suitable as first garment projects. So enjoy browsing through her collection and thanks also to Erica. Unfortunately, it's time for us to say goodbye now. So we've all squished on the couch together. We're all fitting very snug. <laughs> Thank you for spending time with us today. And we'll see you again in the next episode. Bye. Bye. to Fruity Knitting. Joining me today is the British knitwear designer Erica Knight and we're in her studio which is in the picturesque seaside town of Hastings on the southeast coast of England. So Erica has authored numerous books on knitting and crochet. She's acted as a design consultant to craft brands and has developed many yarn ranges over the years. And Erica is particularly passionate about supporting British wool and manufacturing, as well as sustainable business practices. It's a pleasure to have you on Fruity Knitting, Erica. Delightful. Been just your hero of mine anyway, or heroine of mine. So it's a, a delight to be doing this, Thank Andrea. you, that's a real honor. <laughs> now, in the 80s, you had a very successful label called Malto, yes. which produced hand-knitted sweaters for high-end fashion houses. And you also had a large cottage industry of, with hundreds of women hand-knitting these sweaters for you. And you've said that it was these women who taught you the fine finishing and tailoring details in knitting. So I thought as an introduction, you could tell us how Malto was set up and also just talk about your relationship with these women and, and the kinds of things you learned from them. Well, yeah, it was a very strange sort of making a cottage industry, um, a small corporate, if you like, uh, because everything that we produced had to be little soldiers. They had to go to the most discerning customers worldwide um, with 30 accounts in New York alone. So it was a very tough uh, 
criteria. And we had knitters uh, from all along the South Coast, even to Hastings. We had one from a chap called Mr Chips in Hastings. But all these people were given different opportunities in their life, would have captained industry. So we, I, if, if you like, w- would design a pattern. I, I didn't know how to do that, really. These people very much helped me. And uh, they would bring so much to the party, as uh, knitters do, that yeah. we know that now, the community. Yeah. So, for example, I think it might have been this garment here, Andrea, too. This was actually like having a, a top ten record or a, a number one, if you like, this this particular uh, garment. But, um, for example, I noticed one day that the... Um, hem of this was very different to the other little soldiers that had come in and this is uh, you'd be very familiar with it of course but it's what we call a continental cast on where you use it's a bit of an industry mm. uh, technique but you cast on with um, waste yarn and that changed it you know mm. those little snippets so they taught you that they taught me so that. One Mrs. Bark, did it. Okay. Mrs. Bark yeah. who lived in Saltine okay. a German lady yeah. and uh, so it was very much that generosity. We created a family. Everybody was involved in the process of getting us to go to Paris, to Milan, where we showed. And it was all that very much that involvement. And you were very young at the time, so you very were young. learning. You were young, you could come up with the good ideas, and then these knitters would show you how to actually make it into a good knitted jumper. Is that correct? Well, that, yes, they could. Uh, they could follow a pattern. They could do all the techniques, but some of them couldn't. Okay. So I started to design uh, simple pieces, very much about um, the simplicity of a stitch, Mm -hmm. the simplicity of a square. And it was how I then interpreted that shape um, and assembled it inside the studio. And that became a, a real signature. The simplicity of what I do then sort of informed really about who I am, and I'm very much about selecting and curating things. But certainly um, the knitters were so much part of our community, everything we did. And if we were learning a new technique, if we were doing something different the next season, then we'd have, and it got to about a thousand outworkers, you know, Um, and uh, that became quite difficult to manage. Mm. You know, I think I was about, 23 or something. I'd been working in textile print before then. And so I had people who would then uh, coordinate with about 10 knitters or 12 knitters. So then we would get them in and we would learn a new technique together. And for example, another lady I had um, who had been a couturier milliner. Mm-hmm. And uh, she could, um, if we were doing intarsia and somebody had mixed up the colours, she taught me to cut it out re-knit it to shape and graft it seamlessly back in. Okay. So Invaluable lessons, yeah, you know, to, yeah. to to make everything count. So when one person brought in a new skill, you could then teach everybody else. We did, you yeah. know, but, but also I was designing by this time yeah. as well and um, uh, or along that time. So it was very much a two-way street. Yeah. And they were friends for life and still are. Okay. We've got some interesting things here. Just very quickly, tell me what this is. Just a quick flip and through. And a quick flip through these. Uh, so you can see, this is, bless her, this is my mum's catalogue. You can see uh, <laughs> from Captain Oates here being a swing ticket, from these ridiculous drawings I used to do called Bert's. Um, very quickly, this is a design shirt I like to parody uh, design. So this is the oversized shirt, but this became a design classic and won us lots of awards. Um, This is one of the floral things I'm talking about, that um, uh, if the colours were uh, wrong. Uh, In um, very simple, as you can see, this is in vogue. And then I think just to uh, show you here, and of course this big shirt became quite the thing. We had a shop in Brighton. Um, which was very curated. Um, But then, quite famously, Boy George used to wear our garments quite a lot, as did a lot of bands in the 80s. Um, But here he is in our big knitted shirt, and um, 
Uh, yeah, in all, in all George's glory. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, you are very well known, but for those who don't know your work, can you? how would you describe what motivates, uh, say, your designing or your aesthetic? Well, I would say it's simplicity. Uh, sim- I always try to pare things back uh, to a simple recipe, if you like. That's why I first started to do the books. Lessons learnt from uh, things informed by what knitters wanted and how I could design with people who made. So I uh, first, it was an idle conversation, but I had with uh, uh, Stephen Sheard with Rowan. Um, but it was um, to make a book to bring people back to knitting. People didn't want to knit. They wanted to cook and they wanted to create gardens, but they didn't want to knit. So these books here, and this one you can see here, Andrew, this was the very first one. Uh, Simple Knits for Easy Living, there you go. And it was all very much about garter stitch. But these how-tos were also done in string, just to elevate the in, the over, the under, the off. To me, that rhythm you know, and for me, it's very much about the process of making things. It's not always about the garment. It's about the process. It's about the mindfulness and creating simple recipes. For example, this is another book. The simple, very much, uh, very neutral colors, very much about the texture coming forward of the stitch. This is classics at home. So uh, books at the beginning were very much about squares and using natural fibers Uh, rugs working uh, short rows. These would be trimmed in uh, waist of scraps of uh, um, linen and suede from the industry. Um, Simple black and white, that's always denoted my look. Uh, Paring things down. Uh, Little things that make life comfort. Big, I've used hemp all the way along. It's the best sustainable fibre, grows anywhere, does... um, You can burn it. You can do everything with hemp. It will save the world. (laughs) These are these are a few more. um, uh, These are loose leaf patterns too. Um, And again, I'd like to keep the shape, the black and white on here. um, The shapes very very simple, and not get again confused with color. Keep it simple. Then the color is revealed on the next page. Okay. Yeah. Or be it a very simple. Uh, color. It's um, a beautiful grazed um, uh, amethyst, if you like. But then that informs. So, so the black and white means people can project their own ideas on it, perhaps without having yes, it forced on them. It's a yeah. recipe. For example, yeah. you know, and again, I, I guess my aesthetic would be this. This would denote um, a simple summer tunic. Um, it's it, we're very different when we um, design in the summer. This, I love asymmetry, and this is just a little travelling um, line. It's no, it's just a, a little uh, forward over, and it just travels up here. So your eye is taken, um, you're not cut off at the widest point of view, but there's an asymmetry of the hem. It's sort of um, uh, cut about. Yeah. And, and also, too, on the neckline, it just softens the whole thing. And then following through, um, these are all, I always put fully fashion marks through uh, three stitches in um, either side if I'm working in pieces um, that, from the industry, if you like. But again, um, just showing that we, I always like to look at the back as well as the front. I think too, and I've been teaching for many years too, um, students tend to sort of do two-dimensional design rather than thinking about a body Mm. and what is fabulous about knitting is soft armor Mm -hmm. it's creating something that we put on it's like an old friend and uh, it's our soft armor against the world I think vents are always lovely Um, very often do a little selvage edge um, in here uh, one and one uh, just to create a nice little finish but that that to me would probably Summarise your style. Summarise my style. Yeah, great. Okay, now how important is the creative preparation phase for you when you're bringing out a new collection? So how much energy do you put in to playing around with different concepts and colours and ideas or even making new mood boards before you actually start the designing? 
Well, Andrew, I'd have to say all consuming. <laughs> it's all consuming. This is a process that is my lifeblood. Uh, this informs everything I do. Um, for me, it always comes back to the landscape. Um, I once had a tutor at art school who had always said that. It always comes back to the landscape. And you know what? It always does. So for me, everything around me informs me. I never, I never run out of ideas. I never dry up. I'm always inspired. And this is just the fun bit. But it's also the, it's fun and it's uh, annoying for everybody around me. Um, it's uh, anguishing, worrying, trying to get it right. Uh, this, though, to illustrate how I do, uh, these are just some very, very uh, uh, reassembled boards, if you like. For me, the landscape here was about the city, the country, and the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and I've lived, and obviously, in all of them. For example, the city here, um, very hard edge. I would write a lot as well. I'll put a lot of words down which um, have emotional connection to me about that. Repeating patterns, uh, systems, that was very important. That informed the stitches that I've got here. Simple slip stitches that have a rhythm to them, that keep your brain going. Disrupting, these sort of stitches that are disrupted uh, when you um, then change rows, and they give a sort of vitality. Um, and then sense of scale, using the same stitch, uh, but in different scales. I do that a lot. I like that. I have favorite stitches, but then I, I'll, I'll change that. And then the palette, very pared down, and um, then very, very neutral, and then pops of color. The country, obviously, in contrast, um, the narrative here is very much about all those um, organic textures, not maybe the pleasing ones, but ones that give surprises of colour, these gnarled barks, and um, and that will inform the uh, beautiful cables. And I really like this cable because it works the same upside and um, down. You know, sometimes with cables and stitches, they can be a bit sad or they can look a bit angry, okay. you know. And I think, um, and when you're working from the top down or whether you're yeah. working from the bottom yes. up. it makes a big difference. It makes a huge yeah. difference. So then we come to the coast. And uh, three years ago, I drifted along like sort of washed up flotsam from Brighton to the coast here at St. Leonard's, which has informed a lot of what I do now. I look out at the sea. Um, so the coast at the moment is all this erosion. So this is very much more expressive, this board, and lots of bits have been washed away and open ladders which reveal something else um, underneath them. Um, lots of little gritty textures in lots of little um, simple uh, yarns and fine yarns and flowing things. Um, yes, I particularly like this this board here. It's gorgeous. This looks a little bit like um, old fishing net or something. Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, debris from around the beaches, which we have in Hastings. These would be some of my drawings. Um, this would take... I mean, some of these things, obviously, I'll have maybe a couple of hours to do, maybe on the spot, maybe in a workshop. Sometimes I'll have a few weeks to, mm. and they'd have to go to a client, and we discuss back and forth, depending on the nature. Uh, for example, the this little um, piece here, um, this uh, piece is very much about traditional feral and things that would have been weathered over time and um, they'd have been left in the water. So parts of it are inside out, parts with the floats showing to create something else. Um, little bits of weathered pattern. But in actual fact, the pattern does actually repeat. Um, it's just, uh, but it's a very, very simple shape as a drawing would show. Very easy. Well, one of those sort of shapes that you I call chuck on the back of a chair. Yeah. You know, so if you you know you can um, uh, just pick it up at any time. Absolutely. And children and up. Typically, what a lot of knitters do is not weave in their ends, yes. <laughs> which is fantastic. And yeah. these things, this is why I'm saying, you know, it, they annoy a lot of people. They want to get a crochet hook and pick up the ladder, or they want to pick up the end. No, not it, not here. That doesn't give me that effect at all. I, I think it looks great. Well, I think it's yeah. little punches of colour, little yeah. pockets. 
I like little details, I think just edge to edge, a uh, little um, three needle cast off on mm -hmm. the shoulder, especially with a drop shoulder. One thing I really hate, I don't know about you, is I, I hate this little blip here, so we'll always pick up and work down, mm -hmm. obviously from top down knitting uh, okay. techniques. So it's a mismatch. Here. Just yeah. little pearl bars that just denote a little bit of subtle textures. They just, they make me tick. This is one of the designs uh, featured in the coastal section. And this has been, um, this is uh, texture. This all came for the book Texture. Um, it's very much about sustainable yarns. And here it is in this uh, latest book. Okay, uh, and that has been got... released fairly recently? Very recently, yes, very recently. So it's now in quite a few languages, which is lovely yeah. to... Um, See, but very simple things. Again, they're simple recipes, some a little bit more um, complex. I do like a challenge um, as well, but um, some pieces uh, a little bit freeform as well, uh, yeah. which I, I like working on the needles, making things up as we go along. Yeah. Now, one of your goals has been to inspire knitters, particularly through your workshops, to tap into their own creativity and to do that through designing their own garments. And you do have little exercises that you like to do with people in your workshops. I thought you could just quickly show us one now. So I, I love to empower people to design. They always say, oh, I can't design, I can't draw, I can't do that. And of course, everybody can. Everybody can do anything they put their mind to it, really. It's a lot of playing around, isn't it's it? It's a lot of playing around, yeah. and that's the fun element. I think we can be very hard on ourselves. We always have that sort of expectation of what if, well, just have a bit of fun. What we do love doing is knitting. And even from back in the days with um, working with my community of outworkers and crafters, many of them could have captained industry. Um, I'm very lucky to have done what I've done and the women that I've met uh, and in craftspeople who inspire me. Anonymous, she was a woman. That is my, all my books are dedicated to these women who went the extra mile with their stitches at dark nights and bringing up children. Purely Creativity will yeah. out, yeah. won't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. we're all passionate about what we do. Mm. I always like to do things in black and white as well. Commercially, um, if we had a very successful uh, design in colour, we'd always do a black and white version of it. It just always sells. What can okay, I tell you? Yeah. Black and white always sells. But this is um, a little uh, a black and white slip stitch. And um, I just thought it might be fun just to have a little go and just, you know, just sort of use the dummy. I think sometimes people, oh, I can't draw, I can't express myself, or they can work a spreadsheet, but nothing else. Now, that's a, this is a very simple um, slip stitch, but we've sort of twisted it, so it's made sort of a, a cable, quite sort of subtle. But, you know, um, and then sometimes if I just want to get something, a gist of something before I start charting or drafting, a pattern, I'll quickly, um, you know, even photocopy something. And here, you are. here's a good okay. um, style. I've cut one out. Now, it's only a little bit of a shape, but yeah. it, it does show you sort of how many how many twists you might need, need from top to bottom. From top to bottom, very quickly. So, and um, this is sort of using, um, I think this is a bit of a worsted weight yarn, uh, weight yarn. So, you know, I just start collaging, if you like, on the body. But always I go back to that classic of um, dog tooth. And you can see here. In this fabric, yeah. This fabric. This is a beautiful sort of dog tooth fabric. And that's going to denote. But I just love the discrete pattern of this. It's timeless. I'm just going to sort of put that over here. Now, this is going to probably be a very busy design or... It'll end up being really simple. So if you just okay. Of, so first of all, you're just getting swatches out and photocopied of swatches. Just and photocopying, having a bit of fun, and then you're thinking, actually, that looks quite nice. That might even denote a nice blanket in some of these stitches. Wouldn't that look rather beautiful? It's a very classic piece. But then I've done some pieces here. Um, you know, which are big scale. I like the scale of dog tooth. Might not use that one in here so much. But also ferals. 
I do love uh, for so this could be an amazing mashup of big patchwork. We're seeing a lot of in fashion now, a lot of patchwork styles. So you know this might just end up in a beautiful um, patchwork. Let me just put that one over there. Over here, sure. maybe just give me that to pin in. There you are, just just to see. Oh, no. And also, I think once you've got swatches, it's good to put them on a form so that you can actually see the scale of it on, on a design, you know, where the pattern falls. You see, for example, we've got a bit of a zigzag going uh, across this lady's um, chest area. Do we want to move the pattern down? So very often you're sort of knitting away over a pattern. You think, oh, is that going to work for me or not? Yeah. You can do a lot of these sort of ad hoc sort of decisions, all those creative decisions you know it's not just about the yarn about the color it's about the pattern it's about the form it's about the stitches where it falls on the body all those yeah. millions of creative decisions when you're designing um a sweater and it may be that you know a motif um is uh we'll, we'll put a motif in as well now that's a lot of things going on but it may be that through drawing, through photocopying, through um, I'll refine that and then I'll come away with, um, oh, that would look, I'll move that across here. It's just another way of liberating your brain. Yeah. You know, yeah. of just freshening things up. So it's all good fun. It is. It certainly is. And that looks great. Actually, I love busyness. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Rococo and the Baroque period when there's ornamentation <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so let's move on to yarn now because you have developed many yarn ranges over the years. So what are some of the most important things you've learnt from doing that? I think the important things um, designing yarns for me, um, as always sort of inform me, is the natural yarns, um, our environment coming back to the landscape, whether they be plant-based or protein-based. Uh, we have a responsibility as hand knitters too. Um, we can change things. We can really change things. And it's about our choices. We can ask the right questions like we do with our food. We can ask the right questions about our clothes and uh, what we make our new clothes from, our clothes that are going to last a lifetime. So it's a huge responsibility, and I've been very privileged in my life uh, career to design yarns so that people want to make mm. a knit with. Mm. So it's very important that they slide through the hands too. So one mustn't forget that. I um, worked in Italy for many, many years too, designing yarn. The two centres in Biella, where there'd be the most beautiful worsted and woolen spun um, spinners. And then in Prato, where there'd be the fancy machines and you have all your wonderful chenilles and uh, frises and crimps and goodness knows what. But I lived through, uh, in Britain too, the death of the textile industry yeah. during the 90s. One of my first jobs when I was 25 was to lay off 2,500 people in a factory in, um, on the borders of Scotland. It wasn't my call. But I never got over that. And that has defined how I design and what I do and what um, pins everything about that. As a designer, you have a responsibility through every single stage of what you do. Yeah. So one of the um, projects um, that has been very dear to my heart has been uh, working back with Rowan, who I've had an association with them, oh, probably mm, <clears throat> 30, 40, 40, 30, a long time. <laughs> um, and this is um, the first traceable yarn, fully traceable yarn that they have produced from a little ar archipelago in the Falkland Islands um, called Pebble Island. The yarn is beautiful. It's a 21.5 micron, so it's very, very soft. And usually, to put that into context, um, uh, generally the British uh, breeds used to be, you'd get maybe 25 to 28. So this is beautiful and soft. Mm. And in fact, James Laxton, who spins this yarn, and I believe you, you may know James mm. well. We've worked with him a lot. And uh, uh, third generation uh, mill. 
And um, this has been an exceptional um, process to bring this yarn yes, to fruition. It's all one flock, isn't it? It's all one flock. Yeah. Six and a half, well, sometimes about 6,700 sheep, oh. all hand sheared. Mm. It's so much better for the, the animal husbandry for mm. the, um, and the uh, whiteness of the fleece is just, just beautiful. It needed good colour too. We took the fauna and the foliage of the islands to inspire, um, to tell the story through the colours um, of, of the yarn. It's a penguin sanctuary as well. So everything informs somebody buying into this rather beautiful, beautiful yarn to ask questions. This is just some ways I sometimes start picking up from our landscape. Obviously, uh, we haven't been able to go out to Pebble Island these last couple of years, but this is my immediate landscape mm. and resonates too with some of those um, coastal things. Um, found pieces, whether they be polished stones or um, eroded woods, um, and found pieces washed up um, seaweed. The sheep actually graze on uh, the seaweed um, in some of the beaches in Pebble Island too. Found man-made pieces. Uh, rusted implements. So all of these, I collect little bits of colour all my life. I have millions of these in my studio and we pull from colour there. So it's a very, very simple range of just um, 11 colours now and a natural colour. So, um, yes. So these are the colours here, which yes. and it was your job to come up with them, yes. wasn't it? <laughs> which is a very exciting creative job. <laughs> And James enjoyed his job of developing a very beautiful worsted spun yarn. So how did you decide on how many colours you actually need to have so that they all work together? Like how many purples or how many blues? Or do you start with three core colours and then you well, thought... Well, oh. one would normally think, you thought, oh, you must have a white or you must have a navy blue. Well, why? Why do you need that? Mm. You 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 don't necessarily need that. But you do think, well, blue, you would look at past sales of that. But people, we all love the blue. And it's mm. the sky and mm. it's landscape colours. And the sea. So, and, the coast. and absolutely. And you try to do, if you can only do one blue, it has to be a blue that's going to be uplifting, that's going to be um, tones of colours. For me, it's very important that these tones all work together. For example, a garment here, this shows every single colour um, in this range. And so I want people to be able to then purchase, be very safe in their purchase, that even with their eyes shut, they can pick three mm. colours. Mm. And they're going to work mm, for them. They do. You know, so if they, you know, I'm just going to take three colours and they're going to really work for them. Uh, they do. So it's they to do. do, it's to do the shopkeeper, uh, you know, we have to support uh, shops as well. And, you know, they might be able to not take all, all the colours, but they can take a curated mm. ones mm. and they know they'll sell. Yeah. And people could be happy putting two, three, five colours together. But here, this is a little uh, piece that would show all the colours. So we have got a little single stripe here, or two row stripes. I do, I do love the one row stripe. Um, it does annoy people too, uh, with the early <laughs> on ends and things, but... Um, but this, it shows each colour. And these are very much about salted and um, eroded colour, yes. if you like, to show the passing of time and its coastal things. So that was very important. They look like they've got a wash of grey or something through them. Would you describe it like that or not? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's very kind on most complexions, most yeah. skin types. Now, I just wanted to very quickly bring you back to something that you said earlier in the interview, and that is um, that you really enjoy the process of making, that you've kind of come full circle right around. And you, you're now, I've noticed in your most recent designs, you're using concepts like intentional mistakes and visible mending. So can you just say a few short things about that? Yes, visible mistakes. You know, there's that thing, isn't there? Do you go back? Do you mend that piece? Um, do you unpick it? Sometimes it hurts physically if you if you don't uh, backwind or what have you. But I've sort of learned to em embrace that. I think sometimes 
that really can start a, a new flicker of inspiration. But also, uh, lately, I've liked to look at the processes much more about what I'm doing and deconstruct piece, pieces and a little bit like working on um, the dummy in a free form way, mm. you get surprises and they act and they spark another creativity. Um, this little hat, for example, this was part of the Pebble Island, very precious yarn, you want to use every scrap. And uh, so we deconstructed the hats. But I'm very much about using waste up when I'm uh, commissioned to do um, uh, a collection. There's always waste. What ends up, it might be a little ball, but, you know, we are as crafters, as hand knitters, hand crocheters, hand makers. They define us. My mm. first memory was trading a little piece of fabric with a friend. You know, this is what we do. They're treasured memories. They, they denote us. So this was part swatching, but then these hats became deconstructed, but they used up the little waste balls of our very precious Pebble Island yarn. But then it was rather nice, that rhythmic embroidery. Not too precious about it, not sashiko, mm. but just mark making. Mm. So I was a fine artist. Here. Yeah. yeah, I was a fine yeah. artist um, at college. And that mark making on um, a page or whatever, that charcoal or pencil or pen. And to me, this is the same. It's a sketch on my needles. Mm. So I love every single little uh, movement. Yeah. And that creates something else. It might be cross stitch. It might be running stitch. It might be uh, seams again, you know, Um and so this is just one. And for me, especially during the last few years that we've all experienced, for me, the throw has become synonymous of being at home, of sending someone a gift of um, your love, mm. of keeping them warm and comfortable. Maybe that we're refugees for no fault of our own yeah. um, in life. These are all pieces that are scrapped in the good old tradition of anonymous she was a woman doing sewing and quilting bees, all clubbing together maybe. But the ends, I leave the ends now, they're part of my journey. They're part of my start of my journey, the continuation of a journey, and um, they've become something else. So this is sort of where I begin to leave off if you like yeah. <laughs> oh, <another laughs> unfinished <laughs> yeah, unfinished finished. business yes. and exactly and here is another example of that isn't it well this to me is an old friend sweater yeah. you put it on um, it's got all the hallmarks of what I love patch pockets because we all need a pocket but all the end show because that's me it's in hemp my favourite material because <laughs> it's a sustainable fibre plant fibre Outside seams from, you could see way back when I had Malto, still doing outside seams, showing the process. Beautiful, sustainable horn buttons. You only need two types, a black and a white one. They go with absolutely everything. And, and embracing loose ends. <laughs> <laughs> and leave a loose end. Yep. I like the way you do it because it looks really artistic. It doesn't look messy. It just, it actually adds to it. <laughs> really like it, yeah. Well, I'm sure people will want to get their crochet hook and, and take them all Not in, everybody. But, uh, no. Each to their own preference. Look, it's been so fascinating to have you on Fruity Knitting, a total privilege for me. Just want to round up with one last question because you have experienced a lot. You've been, you know, you're living history through the, through the, <laughs> in, in the nicest possible way, yeah, through, through the knitting world, which is I find is so precious and valuable for us and also younger knitters who are coming in and to hear your story. So the last question is, do you have any interesting stories on advice so advice maybe you've received and ignored or advice you've received and followed well advice that i've lived by mm -hmm. is every fault a fashion okay so you know and that was told to me by this wonderful lady that um ooh, walked into my life and taught me so much but every fault a fashion so it is embracing your mistakes um, making them into something else 
and and I think that's a pretty good words yeah. to live by. Yeah, and They're being inspired by. by what has happened accidentally. Absolutely, yeah. not always being prescribed, but go with the flow, yeah. thinking at the moment and making the best of that. Mm. Well, it has been such a privilege and I'm sure the viewers feel that too. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank <laughs> you so much. Let's say goodbye to the viewers. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.